today is Mother's Day. And, and so Mother's Day is the way we celebrate in this country is, is, is a relatively new holiday. Um, it was started in 1907 by Ann Jarvis to honor her mother. Hallmark got um, into it quite a bit pretty quickly and Mother's Day cards became heavily associated with Mother's Day and the sale of Mother's Day cards and even Ann Jarvis, the founder of Mother's Day, um, lamented and complained about the commercialization of the holiday. Much like Christmas gets, gets critiqued for being commercialized um, within certain Christian communities. It's, it, they, they take note of how secular and commercial the holiday has gotten. So anyway, the same thing happened with Mother's Day. Um, that's not to say that Ann Jarvis was the first person to honor her mother. And that there's been no idea of um, yeah, paying homage to or or respect to one's mother, or even formalizing on some level. Um, Krishna also identifies himself with the mother in the Gita, literally saying, um, Pitaham Asya Jagato Mata Data Pitamaha. I'm the mother and the father and the maintainer of the universe and also the, the, grand, the grandfather. Um, when Krishna talks about the creation of the world, he also identifies himself both with the masculine and the feminine and uses a, a sexual metaphor uh, you know, a, uh, of intercourse um, and, and impre impregnating the material world. So Krishna speaks about Mama Yoni, Mahat Brahma, that my womb is the great Brahman. Garbam Dadam Yaham, into that womb I place the seed. So Krishna claims both the masculine role and the feminine role um, in terms of creating the world. And, you know, and give him a full um, meta metaphor of, of impregnation been claiming both the masculine and feminine roles in that metaphor. Um, I think that in today's society especially, uh, mothers and fathers will oftentimes be somewhat interchangeable. If we were to, if we were to, if you were to say, I was asked to be a part of a, a panel uh, in, a, in a, a discussion on the, you know, within a, a, a discussion um, on the responsibility that attends to somebody being a male. So it was a men's group symposium. And then they asked me to be part of a panel, and it was men. The whole group was men, and then the panel was also made up of men, and the, the purpose of the discussion was to articulate and identify and, and speak about the unique responsibilities uh, that men have. This is, and you know, this is, there's a men's movement, there's a women's movement, there's, Sometimes, even if you go to AA programs, sometimes they'll have AA programs or, or group therapy sessions. They're only attended by men or only attended by women. Um, sometimes they find that that's a, an easier environment for people to, uh, to do group therapy in. So anyway, it was, it was that type of a thing, and it's certainly common enough. So there was a devotee group, and they were doing this, and they asked me to be part of the discussion. 
And uh, a number of the other speakers, they spoke and they were saying, you know, we've got to be faithful and responsible and, and um, uh, we have to provide and protect and, and uh, be chivalrous and, and courageous, so on and so forth. The, the normal qualities that you would um, that would come to mind automatically when thinking about the role of men or the role of fathers in a society. And I just, being a little bit subversive and a, a bit of a contrarian, um, I pointed out how to speak about those qualities as uniquely pertain to men and therefore being the type of thing you would discuss in an all-male setting. But that was fairly offensive to women because it indicated that they weren't courageous or chivalrous or protecting or responsible or providing. In fact, in today's society, we find that women do all those things for children uh, and in the household. Things were a little, you could say, more standardized and there were more discrete categories for men and women half a century ago, maybe a century ago, even more so. Perhaps for most of recorded history in almost the entire world, women stayed at home, they had children, they provided for those children, and cooked and cleaned, and, and they lived what would be considered now a traditional lifestyle. Um, you know, and, and women weren't even allowed to participate in the political process in this country until about 100 years ago, 1919 or something like that. Um, when women were given the right to vote, prior to that, women did not vote. They didn't participate in the choosing of our representatives and choosing of our government. Um, and that was the first big uh, hurdle that the women's movement um, uh, overcame. The, the suffrage movement, the right to vote. Then in, in World War II, uh, and, you know, 99.9% .9 of people who die in war are men, if you look historically. 94% of um, workplace deaths, 78% of suicides. If you look at the numbers across the globe, across history, those are the numbers. Are men die in war, men go to war, men die in war. Men die doing dangerous jobs, and men, and men commit suicide in far greater numbers than women do. Um, I mean, like very statistically significant. Seventy percent of men commit suicide. That number is 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 the significance of that number is uh, it's 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 profound. To consider that the, the role our, our culture places, you know, the responsibilities our culture places on men, such that they're, you know, three to one, more than three to one, almost four to one, more likely to commit suicide, um, and feel that responsibility and, uh, as being intolerable. So anyway, in, in World War II, then uh, men went off to fight in this country. And there was a second wave of feminism. Um, and that was when women began to work in, in, in large numbers. And if you look um, at posters and art from that World War II period, you find that there's a, 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 a trope or a, um, 
a figure that, that, that comes up again and again and is, is plastered all over World War II art um, that has to do with women working and entering the workforce. Does anybody know who, who that person is? Rosie the yeah, Rosie the Riveter. Rivets are when you... you attach metal with rivets to other metal. Um, something like welding. Those rivets, those little, I mean, mechanically attach one piece of metal to another. And so Rosie the Riveter, so you'll see it's like a fierce looking, almost like a pinup model a little bit. That's the way it's depicted. So Rosie the Riveter looks almost like a pinup model from the 50s or something like that, but it's the 40s. And she's working a handkerchief around her neck and maybe a hat on and she's, she's working. And that's basically, she's got a strong arm, yeah. And so, uh, and that was designed to, to, to encourage women to go and work because the men weren't around because the men were off fighting in a war and the country still had to run and so women went and entered the workforce. And in a similar way, I mean, very similar to communist propaganda from around that time about empowering different people. It was, it was like that, but it was done in the U.S. Um, there was a whole, also a whole hemp for victory campaign. We needed rope, and so they forced people to grow hemp in the U.S. so they could use it to make twine and rope and stuff like that for the... Um, for the, you know, primarily, I think, for the war in the Pacific, the, you know, the naval um, expeditions, primarily in the Pacific, when we were fighting World War II. Anyway, that was wave two. And then wave three of the feminist movement happened more in the 60s and 70s, what we would normally associate with the feminist movement and the civil rights movement. Um, and you have a fourth wave of feminism that took place in the late 80s, early 90s, when different groups of women started to say, hey, there's not one voice that speaks for all of us. And they took a little bit more of an intersectional approach where, let's say, Latino women um, had their own voice and thoughts and feelings about what it meant to be empowered. Or even some women chose voluntarily to live a traditional life and they wanted that to be counted as also empowered. If just because they chose to stay at home and be homemakers, instead of going out in the workforce, they didn't want somebody defining for them what feminism was. They wanted to be able to define for themselves and for their community ethnically or, or based on some other notion. They wanted to say, hey, you know, I'm a black feminist, I'm a Mexican feminist, or I am someone who chooses to stay at home, or I'm a lipstick feminist, I choose to celebrate my femininity instead of um, uh, trying to uh, do away with it. I choose to embrace my femininity instead of trying to look uh, androgynous, or thinking that that's empowered. Rather, I think that wearing lipstick and heels and, 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 and you know, using traditional um, symbols of femininity can also be an empowered act. That is the fourth wave of feminism. So I was talking at this men's group and, and I, I pointed out how rude it was and even offensive it was to women to think that things like earning money, providing for a family, protecting a family, um, was solely the role of men. And although that may have been true, more true 100 years ago, 200 years ago, especially nowadays, especially in the country we're sitting in, there's, there's much more equality and there's much more of an equal division of labor and responsibility that takes place amongst men and women in terms of providing for children and providing for a family unit. And so, we have to, if we really want to think about what it meant to be a man or a father that was different than what it meant to be a woman or a mother with regard to the family unit and society at large, um, there's really one major distinction. 
men have more upper body strength than women. If you compare the upper body strength of men, because they don't have breasts, lactating breasts, they have a lot more upper body strength, which communicates, translates to a lot more capacity for violence. And then women, in turn, they get pregnant and they lactate. And so the, 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 the one thing is, is this, it's this. Women get pregnant and lactate, which means they do not have as much capacity for upper body strength. And men don't get pregnant and they don't lactate and therefore they have a, a body which is physically more powerful, specifically the upper body strength there. If you compare women's lower body strength to men's lower body strength, there's much less of a difference statistically than when you compare men's upper body strength to women's upper body strength. There's, much more, there's a much bigger difference there. Um, and so on a day like Mother's Day, you, you maybe you celebrate the Divine Feminine and you think about what mothers do, or you might think about what your mother did for you, but if you think about what your mother did for you, then your answers are going to be very, very different. You may have had a stay-at-home father. We feed our children formula now, by and large. Or you can express milk. Sometimes women are the primary bread earners in society. More and more you have both parents working and contributing uh, to the household income. Uh, men are cooking more and cleaning more and performing what would be traditionally considered to be more of a woman's duties in the household. <clears throat> and so, I, I, I want, I, what I want to do today is I just want to think about, and I, I guess this is getting to the heart of what I want to speak about for today's class, I want to think about what it is that makes a mother special. What's different about mothers and fathers? And if you want to really get there, you have to look biologically at the necessary differences because the societal differences and the cultural differences are, are especially in this country, but all over the world, they're, they're changing substantially. Women vote now. They work now. They're, they're, they're more, uh, they have more access to education than ever before, to financial freedom, And so, you know, and men can also, you know, in, in, in turn, men can also be homemakers and nurturers in, in a way that they, you know, that previously they were too busy going out to war or whatever it was at the, to, to, to do that. And so if we look at today's society, it's, 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 it's considerably different than the way society looked 100 years ago, where the gender roles were much more well-defined and standardized. And, and if we look at it now, there's just, there's just a lot more play. So I guess one way to handle a, a Mother's Day celebration or to honor mothers would be to look at the role that your mother played in your life growing up. But in that, in that situation, it would be very, very um, individuated. And it would be very, each person would have a unique experience. Somebody would say, oh, my mother, worked and my mother stayed at home or my mother cooked or my mother didn't cook my father cooked and my mother you know did other things around the house and you you'll 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 start to encounter especially now and especially in this country you'll start to counter you know, just so much variance that really it almost becomes like parent day where you're celebrating your parent and then those roles are largely interchangeable between mothers and fathers. And it's just, you know, well, your mother did this, but your mother did this, and your father did this, but your father did this. And it's, it's, it's almost like a, you know, shuffling a, a deck of cards, what your particular childhood looked like. It's much less, you know, standard. You're going to find much less uniformity. So anyway, one way would just be to just, you know, take the individual approach, and here's what it was for me. 
The other way would be to try to figure out if there is something special about mothers that makes them different than fathers. And if you want to do that, you'd have to look in, ultimately in biology. You have to look at, you know, what makes women biologically distinct from men and therefore what makes mothers necessarily distinct from fathers. And then extrapolate from there and use that as your starting point. And so when you do that, you know, and, and interestingly, although this tendency, and this is going to be, listen carefully now, I've been warming up, I'm getting warm, and now I'm starting to get warm. Although you might say, I'm a traditionalist, and therefore, I have a more standardized and uniform understanding of the role that women are supposed to play vis-a-vis -vis men in the lives of their children and in society. Krishna's not quite so traditional. In most religious texts, the deity is defined as male and specifically as a father. That's normal for five billion plus of the people of the world's population. Christianity is three billion, Islam is 1.5 to two billion. And so if you add those two numbers together where God is the father, you're looking at five billion people, two thirds of the world's population, just quick numbers, quick math. Not even you know, getting into more but just two-thirds of the world's population, thinks of God almost exclusively in male terms. And, you know, although Mary gets prayed to in Catholicism as a salvific figure, she's still not part of the Trinity. <laughs> still the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so the, the Trinity is decidedly male. And you might throw Mother Mary in there. She's, she's got her own mantra. You know, you can hail Mary and she can save you, as can a bunch of saints. But she's kind of like a saint plus. But she didn't make the Trinity. <laughs> and so she's still a notch below. And anyway, Catholics are kind of a minor sect of Christianity for maybe the first time in history. They're much more of a modern sect, they'll say in the last 100, 150 years, their numbers have declined substantially as Protestant Christianity has taken over. And so this is even more so true for Protestants. But even amongst Catholics, it's also true. Um, Krishna doesn't do that. Krishna says, I'm the mother of the universe. My womb gave rise to the universe. From my womb came the universe. I am the mother of the universe. I'm the father of the universe. And I, you know, gave the sperm of the universe as well. And, you know, so, well, as the ovum, I gave the sperm as well. Um, and so you find Krishna taking much more of, let's say, a, 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 a stance where men and women are, at least, you know, in certain places in the Gita, I think there are other places where he's a bit more patriarchal. I'm just thinking of it now. But at least in these instances, when he starts to identify himself, with the male and the female. Um, Krishna does argue that, you know, men have to protect women. If they don't, then, then bad things will happen. That, 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 that's actually Arjuna's argument. Um, Krishna acknowledges the privileged place that, that men have in society in one place in the Gita without necessarily endorsing that in his eyes men are privileged. He acknowledges that men have a privileged place in society vis-a-vis -vis women. Uh, but he says that women can go back to heaven, that women have full rights as a soul. And that might seem like a fairly obvious teaching, but it certainly wasn't thousands of years ago. It certainly was somewhat subversive to postulate the spiritual equality of women. Um, keep in mind, women didn't have a right to vote in this country until fairly recently. And that was all based on ideas about women's role, you know, stemming from the Bible, stemming from religious texts. Um,
Anyway, so Krishna has much more of what you might say a modern interchangeable viewpoint where he honors men and women equally and specifically identifies himself as being both masculine and feminine. And in that sense, Krishna is a fairly typical Hindu because on Hindu altars you worship Radha Krishna, Sita Ram, Lakshmi Narayan. And so, you know, that's, it's, 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 it's the norm to worship both the feminine and the masculine moieties or halves of the divine is, is very standard in Hinduism. It goes all the way back to the Rig Veda, which is the first religious text I'm aware of where God is referred to in feminine terms, which is the original Sanskrit text, the oldest Sanskrit text in existence. Um, but yeah, Krishna has, I, I think, a worldview which would be much more compatible with this interchangeable equal rights recent phenomena in human history and you look at his conception of divinity as being both masculine and feminine and claiming both of those roles himself it's much more of this both are valued and both are equal mindset and so the traditionalist has a, at least within our sect within our particular tradition has a problem in that Krishna appears to have more of a modern approach thousands of years ago, indicating that the modern approach is actually ancient and that what people think of as traditional might be medieval but not necessarily ancient and therefore not ultimately traditional. Did you guys follow that? That's an interesting point. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the haploid gametes that are involved in production of children, but women produce only X chromosomes and men produce X chromosomes and Y chromosomes and males are created by the influx of Y chromosomes and so if it was only women there would be no men. Of course both parties are required to donate their haploid to gametes to the equation or to produce a child, but if men produce a double X chromosome, then a, child, a female is born, and if they produce one Y chromosome, then a male is born. So men contribute that, which interestingly is, is considered, that's also a Vedic thing. It says that the men are responsible, like somehow their semen is what creates either a male or a female child, and in fact, modern science bears that out. And this was just discovered in the last, hundred years um, with microscopes. They were looking, I think, at wasps originally when they figured this out, and then beetles, and then they figured it out with humans within the last hundred years. And I think maybe it was 140 years ago they started getting into chromosomes with wasps. Um, so yeah, I thought it would be, you know, if you want to think about what is it that makes a woman or a mother special that men can't touch. I thought that was a worthwhile question to ask, as opposed to just throwing out traditional tropes and not recognizing that they might be offensive, as opposed to taking an individual approach where you just said, well, here's what my mother did for me. I thought if we could figure out what it is that makes women different, fundamentally, there's value in that. And Jess has something to say. Yeah. That's true. Women lactate, and therefore they breastfeed children, and men can't do that. There's maybe something that's even more important that differentiates women from men. Can anybody maybe guess what that might be? They, give, they carry the child in their womb, and they, obviously you know this. I'm not thinking you don't know this, but I want to order things properly and create a little bit of a hierarchy. So they carry the child in their womb, give birth, and then lactate. Those are big. <laughs> those aren't small things. And those things will never change. 
those are unique things that are involved in um, being a woman as distinct from being a man, being a mother as distinct from being a father, that um, aren't interchangeable. They aren't societally chosen. They're not cultural norms. They're basic biological features of human life and its propagation. And then you can extrapolate from that. You can extrapolate from that. And when you think about um, breastfeeding and you know, then what goes along with that is nurturing and caring for. Even if you look at women's bodies, their hips are like a, just a, the hip, the woman's hip, which is quite distinct from a man's hip, such that if you were to just do a line drawing, just a, like two or three lines, and you were to draw the female form versus the male form, the defining feature that would differentiate if you were looking at a very, very primitive, simplistic, abstract, or, or you know, but extremely reductionistic drawing, just, just pencil drawing, maybe you, had, uh, you could only draw three lines. I, mean, I guess you could try to draw the genitalia, but if you were to try to draw the actual female form, it would be the hip and, and the breasts, that hourglass shape that women just even skinny women, even women with no hips, have bigger hips than men. Women with no hips have bigger hips than men with hips. You follow? And so it's just, it's, it's, uh, and it's like a natural baby carrier. And if you're a guy and you're holding the kid, it's just, it's, a, it's a, like a semi-bicep curl isometric contraction. But the women notch the kid right in on their hip. And it's like a little seat <laughs> that nature put, a little baby seat that nature gave them. They're walking around with a little bit, almost like you know you have those uh, those baby carriers. Women have an automatic baby carrier built into their skeleton, <laughs> which is wild. So I think that if we start with biology and caring children, birthing children and lactation along with perhaps if you want to add you know for extra credit the hips for, for caring children those things are undeniable they're basic differences and then extrapolating from those nurturing caring for feeding pacifying, connecting with children. The children start to mimic their mother's accent within 10 days or two weeks. The cry of the child begins to rise and fall along with the accent of the mother's voice and the cadence of her voice. This has been studied. Men could jump in. You know, there's something called attachment theory. Children, especially human children, require, you know, we're, we're different. We're different than, uh, you know, a famous story I tell is one of our cows got pregnant accidentally. And cows are big animals, so our cow got pregnant. You know, and cows weigh, our cows weigh, you know, 1,000, 1,200 pounds. And so she got pregnant accidentally, and we just didn't notice. We just thought, you know, Betsy's just, you know, putting on a little weight, eating a lot of hay, and we, just, we didn't know she was pregnant. And then one morning, we got up at our farm, and we went to go milk the cows, and there was a calf there. Because she'd given birth during the night. We didn't know she was pregnant. She gave birth, and the calf was just walking around and suckling and playing and jumping up and down. Humans aren't like that. We don't have the... 
Birth is, is a dangerous game. Modern, one of the things modern medicine did was make birth way less dangerous for the women. But women used to die regularly in childbirth. C-sections are like a miracle. Things go south. You can just slice a woman's belly open, yank out that kid, and, and not kill the woman. She gets a big scar, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, but, you know, traditionally, before the modern surgical interventions, giving birth was dangerous business. A breech baby, that was like a nightmare. If the baby wasn't coming out head first, it's coming out sideways, that was just a nightmare. And you can't always just, oh, we just massage it over like this. Yeah, it doesn't always work like that. It's not that you can always do that. It doesn't always work. Plenty of women, and famous women in recorded history, died because their child was a breech baby. It was almost a death sentence for women and the baby. Um, so, yeah. You know, you could ex children need an attachment figure, and so if the mother isn't there and the father is there, or even if some stranger is there, human beings need someone to be there to take care of them, and so they'll they'll attach themselves to whoever. But the natural thing is they attach to the breast and they start to form this intimate bond with the mother. And, you know, I, I have six children, and I was there at the, at the birth of all six of my children, and I tried to connect with all six of my children, but it's just not the same. It's, it's, if the mom is there and she breastfeeds, that giving of milk and, and, and being there to give milk and the comfort and the security and the, and the feeling of being loved and the feeling of being cared for that comes with that milk and that milk which is a shelter and it, it, it makes the child feel secure and sedates the child what to speak of nourishes the child and keeps them alive that just the woman's just on a different it's just on a different level yeah there's just no comparison and the, the closeness a baby will naturally feel to its mother in a lactation situation where the mom's available to, to give that milk, there's no, there's no comparison. Men just can't occupy that space. Um, we can get in the way of that. We can get in the way of that. We can societally adjust that. We can you know, feed babies with formula, express the milk, have the man stay at home, and the, the child will adapt to that. Um, but it's the natural biological dispensation and responsibility given to mothers by the ability to lactate, by having carried the child in their womb and connecting with the child in that very intimate way. The child literally lives in your body. Women grow an extra organ. The placenta, they grow an extra organ to nourish their child. It's amazing. It's a huge organ. That the woman grows inside her own body to take care of the child. It's like you become a, a, a unique, you, you grow an extra organ. It's like, you know, men have the extra rib. Okay, women have an extra organ. It's, it's significant. And I think, you know, by grounding the discussion of what makes a mother special in these things, I think that you end up with a, a more mature, more resilient argument, one that's less cultural, one that's less arbitrary, and one that's more rooted in science and reality and the reality that it, there is a difference between males and females, including within the human species, that no amount of cultural engineering can do away with. And then you, you have a firm ground and then from that ground, you can then springboard off and you can extrapolate. And then qualities like a, a mother is nurturing, for example. Let's just take that one. That's not just an arbitrary quality given to women. It's inexorably linked to the fact that they literally nurture by feeding, by carrying the child.
by birthing the child, by growing an extra organ to provide for the child. And of course, men, then the argument that men are the protectors then gets linked to men's increased upper body strength and therefore capacity for violence and therefore responsibility. And now all of a sudden, men dying in wars more often than women, men dying in the workplace more often than women. It starts to be less just culturally engineered and starts to be more basic. There's this thing called the gender equity paradox because in uh, northern European countries, which are the bastion of equal rights, like Norway, they've been trying to get men to be nurses and women to be engineers for 50 years. And there's huge government incentives for men to become nurses and for women to become engineers. But despite their best massive government-funded attempts to make men into nurses and make women into engineers, 90% of engineers are male and 90% of nurses are female. And they just can't figure it out. Why they can't engineer culturally having more male nurses. But that role essentially of being a mother and a caregiver and a nurse and nursing someone, nurturing someone, it's more natural for a woman. And that math-based engineering, they actually did a thing where they looked at men and women the day they were born. Because they found that men played with cars and women played with dolls from the age of six to nine months. And so they said, okay, there's, the difference is basic. But then they said, no, you've been programming them since they were born. And then they swaddled a boy in a pink blanket and swaddled a girl in a blue blanket. And people start saying, oh, she's so pretty. Or, oh, he's so strong. And so they're saying, see, you're programming your kids from a young age. So they, they photographed children the day they were born. So they couldn't have been indoctrinated. That, that the argument wouldn't work. And they found that female children looked at faces and male children looked at pictures of, pictures of faces and male children would look at pictures of uh, machinery. The day they were born. And in fact, they were able to link the amount of testosterone that was in the amniotic fluid to the length of time they would look at the machines. Therefore, the more, more testosterone. They could even identify exactly what it was. Most, both men would have testosterone. Both men would have estrogen. But men have ridiculously larger amounts of testosterone than women do. And those, that, those uh, um, sex hormones um, also affect your brain chemistry. It actually means that men are more sociopathic than women because they are less empathetic and less able to recognize emotions in others. So it's not even necessarily a flattering thing towards men. Um, but this is, it's basic. It's basic to the human animal. And so when we, when we glorify women as being nurses or nurturing or motherly, which is, like we say motherly, it's synonymous with nurturing and nursing. It's, it's the word motherly. Naturally, like we say, oh, she, he's very motherly. It means he's very nurturing, very empathetic, very understanding. That's not just arbitrary that we as a culture have defined that as being a gender role for women. It's actually linked to their innate biology. That doesn't mean we can't explore men being more motherly and women being more fatherly and women shouldn't work in the workplace and there aren't many, many roles that can be switched. But it does mean that it's not merely culturally engineered when you talk about what it means to be motherly and what's special about being a mother. And it's not just individual and what you experience. There is something, some je ne sais quoi, some certain something that you can point to that is unique about being a mother. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to attempt to define what that was somewhat rigorously and somewhat comprehensively and, and to make a strong, sustainable argument and we benefit by having 
strong, violent figures who can protect us from harm. And we benefit by having um, nurturing figures that nurse us and nourish us and protect us in a different way, emotionally. Interestingly, for a child, the mother is a giant and a god and a powerful being capable of giving protection. You follow? And also for a child, um, um, a father is capable of giving nourishment and figuring it out. And, and so a father, if, if need be, can also play this role. So the roles aren't absolutely non-interchangeable. But there's really these two basic roles that a child needs. In fact, when you have a child growing up with one parent versus two parents, and there's a, there's a limit, and somebody has to do double duty and play both roles, the, the children born of a single parent die younger, are more likely to be incarcerated, have less uh, high levels of education, earn less money, get sick more often, are more likely to become drug addicts or alcoholics, are more likely to themselves be divorced and have unsustainable relationships. The amount of evidence there is that not having both these roles played in your life has a, a, a detrimental effect. The amount of evidence there is demonstrating that is massive. Right, doctor? You've read this, right? Yeah. It's incredibly well done. So I think, I think celebrating your mother as, as nurturing and unconditionally loving and nursing and giving and, you know, like we say, oh, yeah, he, like, you know, oh, he gave, he gave a kidney. You know, so we say that, like, oh, you gave, you know, he loves me so much, he gave a kidney for me. So we use that as a turn of phrase. Women actually automatically gave a kidney to all their children in the form of their placenta, an equivalent organ. It's very, very rare that someone actually donates your kidney, their kidney to you, which you can do. You got two of them, you only need one. It's very, very rare that you'll find someone, you'll be required for it to happen, and somebody will want to donate a kidney to you. But in fact, every child had their mother donate an organ to them. And it's incredible. I mean, when, when a woman gets pregnant, her hair falls out, she gets anemic, her, like her body is sapped of vital nutrients that are given to the child they're not there for her. Her teeth get more jacked up. She's more, more like, my, my wife never had a cavity her whole life. So she's in her 20s. And then she got cavities as a result of giving birth, you know, having, carrying children. Anemia as a result. Many women get this, um, um, what was it? Osteoporosis, yeah, your bone, your bone density goes down. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of that, but that's also true. That's also true, right? So your bone density goes down. Your teeth, are, your, the, the, the strength of your teeth go down. Your, your, your minerals in your body get sapped from you in the form of iron. Your blood volume doubles. And you have like this massive amount of extra blood you have to carry around to feed your child and oxygenate your child and take care of your child. But there's also, there's also uh, gestational um, diabetes. There's a whole bunch of diseases women get as a specific result of being pregnant. A woman will get pregnant and become diabetic then give birth and recover from the diabetes. You can even see if a woman's given birth because you can see indentions made on the pelvis, on the bones of the woman, from the child's head scraping against the bones. The child's head scrapes against the bones on the pelvis, and it, like a tree, you can see how many fires a tree's been, you can see how many, so you can, you can see that on women this etching in their bones created by giving birth. And so I think there's value in reflecting on these empirically observable realities and then extrapolating from them carefully about some of the more abstract and virtuous roles that women play in our life. I think there's value in that. I believe that the virtues in Greek mythology are conceived of as being feminine in nature. There's a number of virtues, the goddesses, and I, th I think they're all goddesses, by the way. That's it. That's what I got. Um, feedback? Comments? Discussion? Yeah. Yeah. 